I feel rather reticent about making this presentation. Um, because of the quality of this audience and the depth of experience and understanding in this audience, and because of the quality of DFID's own thinking about it, um, which doesn't quite match the quality of the audience, I don't think, at the moment. But I think you need to bear with us. As Peter said yesterday, this is the coming together of rights and conflict of two newer areas means that we are all asking ourselves questions. Um, and what I'd like to do today is to give you an idea of some of the questions that we are asking ourselves. I wanted to start off being a good civil servant with a quote from our minister, but I think it's an important quote. Um, because it, it, does, it does sort of set the scene as, in terms of where we are at the moment. Um, and this was a speech that Hilary Benn gave on democracy in October of this year, where he said, first and most fundamentally, we will consider the freedoms to as equally important as the freedoms from. This puts rights, the freedoms to, at the very centre. Human rights, alongside reducing poverty and sound financial management, are at the heart of our development partnerships. But, and this is a really important but, we need to explain more clearly what this will mean for the way we work. In terms of human rights policy and references, we have a fairly rich tapestry, I suppose. And dating back to the UK Human Rights Act, most significantly at least, in 1998, which put... Um, European Convention on Human Rights into UK legislation. I just want to touch on the Human Rights Act because for me I think it's extremely significant and interestingly enough I think it's seeing domestically in the UK a bit of a resurgence at the moment. Um, but it means that human rights considerations must inform and guide all our actions. That's our policy, our programme and our employment actions. Um, we are bound by the Act in everything that we do. So it's an inward and an outward responsibility to, to be, hmm, I need to get the language absolutely right, but, but to, to promote the convention. Also recognition, and this was in the guidance note, that human rights are already part of our core values. As an organisation, human rights, protecting and promoting human rights is part of our core values and our existing policy commitments. That we should be taking a policy of do no harm where there are human rights concerns, we think they are, we should be taking them into account. And more importantly, I think, or as importantly, taking the Human Rights Act not as something that we're scared of falling foul of, not as something that we're scared of being taken to court on, but as a positive approach, as seeking opportunities to say, we've got a fabulous driver here, let's use it in terms of improving our development practice. The white paper is, is another significant, obviously, piece of policy, our third white paper as, as, as Department for International Development. Um, and if some of you have, will have read it, Making Governance Work for the Poor, it's his title, um, it takes a very strong focus on governance and the processes of governance. Um, and equally, a strong focus on effective states. And the quote comes from that, effective states are central to development. They protect people's rights. This is also based on, a, on a, an analysis that the majority of poor will be in so-called fragile states. And we can discuss what fragile states are and the interaction then between human rights and fragile states afterwards. Um, and that we are understanding rights and governance more broadly under these three headings with, within DFID, the so-called CAR framework, but capability, accountability, and responsiveness. Um, that those are the three aspects of governance that we will want to look at. And the white paper made a commitment to take forward these things called quality of governance assessments, now called country governance analysis, where we would gather in information um, on capability, on accountability, and on responsiveness. And we would use those, including on the causes of conflict and insecurity, and use those to inform the choices we make about aid resources, thank you very much, um, and about the programmes that we choose. Um, I'll do a quick slide on understanding the conflict in DFID and, and, and where we are also. Um, some of you may or may not know there will be a new conflict policy launched from DFID or by DFID on March the 14th. Um, and the thrust of that is that we're understanding conflict as existing at all times. It's, it is not necessarily something that we should try and eradicate. Conflict exists, per, prima facie. Um, but the problem is a violent conflict. And therefore, our aim is to consider how conflict is managed so that it doesn't arise in, in, in violence. Um, that, that is then thinking about the formal and informal systems to do so. Um, and rights-based mechanisms are key to this. And it means thinking much more structurally about equality and inclusion. 
I want to touch quickly on what's happening now. We're running a training course on human rights for all our staff. That's not been done before, um, but is responding to a need for people at programme level saying, we need to better understand what does human rights mean for us, including our conflict advisors. We've had conflict advisors coming in here. <laughs> We're developing some practical guidance for assessing human rights um, at country level. That's feeding into this analysis, country governance analysis, so that our staff can have a better idea of the sorts of things they should be looking at, the sorts of discussions they should be having. So we can try and build up some sort of composite picture. The country governance analysis is underway. So Ethiopia and is, is certainly coming through. Vietnam's just coming through. And these will be public documents, by the way, um, and publicly available. Um, I just wanted to give you a flavour of some of the questions we're asking ourselves at the moment within DFID. We have the Human Rights Act, right? That binds us to promoting human rights in our internal and our external processes. But, you know, is that going to make us look like a different sort of organisation, talking differently? What does that mean in terms of our internal values? And we don't really know at the moment, and we need to work that through. We have a conflict in humanitarian department. We have a policy department looking at rights. We don't always come together. Um, and we, we actually need, again, it's this common narrative. Um, keeping it real, which was the sort of the title, um, slightly, which is there is a lot of intellectual fervor at the moment. We've got great work going on with um, Oxford on social exclusion, fragile states, human rights. There's some really interesting stuff happening through DAC. Does that fundamentally change our practice? Does that really result in different things happening in Sudan, in Afghanistan? Um, talking to one of our, our advisors yesterday, she said, well, what does this mean for the way that we work in Helmand province? Right? And what does this mean for the discussion we have with the British Army in Helmand province, specifically? I think I'm going to stop there. there is, <laughs> I've got plenty more to say if you want me to. Um, but I want to just give you a flavour of some of the questions we're asking ourselves. And I think the point is that we haven't got it right, and we're really grateful for any learning that comes. So thank you.